Hey y'all, welcome back. Now that we've let SP hybrid orbitals kind of sit and process a little bit, we're going to return to this and talk about <clears throat> how molecular orbitals change from the atomic orbitals. They change into different molecular orbitals. <clears throat> we're going to talk about that again for uh, central atoms that have three and four electron domains around them. <clears throat> so just a review uh, from yesterday. We're talking about the change from atomic orbitals into molecular orbitals. And yesterday we used the example of beryllium and how beryllium's atomic orbitals of 2s and 2p can't explain the bonding that occurs when beryllium forms molecules like BEF2, right? If we had used beryllium's s orbital and p orbital, 2s, 2p, to bond with fluorine's p orbitals, <clears throat> the overlap would have had some issues like the wrong angle, it would have bonded at the wrong angle, and bond lengths we would have ended up with two bond lengths, two different bond lengths in this molecule, and we don't see that. We see a 180 degree angle in this molecule, and we see two identical bond lengths. And so <clears throat> what we are, are assuming is that the atomic orbitals of beryllium, 2s and 2p, the atomic, the valence orbitals that are doing the bonding, they hybridize. So the 2s and the 2p atomic orbitals hybridize and we get out two new molecular orbitals and we call them sp and sp. And these new sp orbitals, sp, sp, they have a different shape and they're at a different angle to each other. The sp orbitals are going to be at 180 degree angles to each other and this explains the molecular shape that comes out. So <clears throat> we're going to talk through this process again <clears throat> for things that have three electron domains or repulsive regions around them and then also for something that has four electron domains around that central atom. Okay. <clears throat> so our example for um, our our molecule that has three electron domains around that central atom is BF3. So BF3, if we were to write the Lewis dot diagram, okay, we would come up with something that looks like this. Remember, boron and beryllium can both form stable molecules. <clears throat> with less than an octet and this is what really this is what boron is doing it's forming a stable molecule here with six electrons around it so it has three electron domains around it three areas of electrons repelling each other around it here we go one two three and if we look at boron's atomic orbitals <clears throat> Uh, let's look this one up. Okay, so bor boron is here and it has two in the 2s and one in the 2p. <clears throat> okay, so if we were to look at that orbital diagram for atomic boron, <clears throat> it would look like that. So we see that it really only has one place uh, one electron that still needs a pair, one electron that's ready to bond. And so it's going to go through this process again. Okay, we're assuming that an electron is going to get promoted. So this is the 1s, the 2s, and these are the 2p orbitals. Okay, so <clears throat> this is atomic. Um, some of these 
the core electrons don't change. We leave the core electrons alone, but one of these valence electrons that's ready to bond, we're going to promote it. So now we have <clears throat> three electrons that are available for bonding instead of just the original one. Now that it's promoted, we see that we do indeed have three orbitals um, that can support bonding, right? We have one, two, three orbitals that are ready to go through this bonding. And so these are the three that are going to hybridize. Instead of having an overlap with the 2s orbital and then overlap with the 2p orbitals, we're going to hybridize these three into three new orbitals. And since we're using an s and 2p, we'll call them s, p, two orbitals. Now notice here that um, I start with these atomic orbitals, right? I'm going to end, if I look at this on an energy diagram standpoint, let me show you what that would look like. <clears throat> okay, the atomic orbitals, here's 1s at our lowest energy, here's 2s, and here's 2p, okay, our th three 2p orbitals. Now, our hybridized orbitals are going to be kind of similar. Let me drag this out of the way. Um, but they're going to change slightly. So I still have my 1s down here. But my 2s and two of my 2ps are going to hybridize into something new. And that something new is going to be at a higher energy than the 2s orbital, but a lower energy than the 2p. So I'm going to get something that looks like this. And these are my s, p, 2 orbitals. Now notice that one of my 2ps does not hybridize right? So that one 2p orbital is still at the same energy level as the original three 2p orbitals were, right? That one doesn't hybridize. It just stays the same. It's still out there. It's still available for interaction. But, but my 2s and two of my 2ps, they're going to hybridize into my sp2. And now that I have my sp2 orbitals and I have three of them, um, I am ready for bonding within this molecule. <clears throat> okay, so you might be able to guess what angle these sp2 orbitals are to each other. Let me erase what I have drawn here. I'm going to redraw BF3. Okay, so <clears throat> I no longer have the the 1s. Oh, I do have 1s. Uh, now I have the 1s, 2 is still the same. I have sp2 orbitals. And there's going to be three electrons in those. And then I still have a 2p orbital left. Okay. So these three <clears throat> sp2 orbitals um, are going to interact at the angles that we would predict for this compound, for this molecule, boron trifluoride, within the Vesper theory. So within the Vesper theory, what angle would these bonds be to each other? They would be 120, right? So the sp2 orbital is going to look something like this. It's similar to the sp orbital. And the, that sp, those sp2 orbitals are going to interact. Let me draw them different colors so you can see the three of them. <clears throat> at 120 degrees to each other. So now boron can offer this interaction with fluorine, right? So fluorine's going to still interact with its 
2p orbital, fluorine does not hybridize. Only the central atom is going to hybridize. Fluorine does not hybridize. <clears throat> so fluorine's still going <clears> to <throat> interact with its p orbital. Boron's going to interact with its three sp2 orbitals. And we see the correct bond lengths occurring, and we see the correct bond angles occurring. Ta-da! Okay, let's do ammonia, shall we? Actually, um, I promised you earlier that we would return to methane. So instead of doing ammonia, ammonia would work. But let's, for the sake of circling back and talking about uh, what we initially started talking about, let's do methane. Okay, so again, we're going to look at the Lewis dot structure for methane, right? We see that our central atom carbon has how many <clears throat> electron domains around it? Four. It has four electron domains around it, and they're all bonding. It's a carbon-hydrogen bond, and we have four of those. All right, so we're going to expect this, these bonds to be in a tetrahedral structure at 109.5. And we talked about why the atomic orbitals couldn't explain this, right? Because if carbons, atomic orbitals, 1s, 2s, 2p, okay, so carbon is element 6. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so if carbon were to just promote this electron, right, and open up that space for bonding, so now carbon can uh, undergo four bonds, right? It would be bonding with a 2s orbital that interacts with hydrogen's s orbital, and then it would also be interacting with it's 2p orbitals, which probably aren't that much bigger than the 2s orbital, but they're a little bit bigger than the 2s orbital, and they would interact with the hydrogen, hydrogen 1s orbital, right? That's what would overlap. And so we see our issues here. They're going to be at the wrong bond lengths. We'll get two different bond lengths. The ss overlap would be one bond length. The ps overlap would be a second bond length. Okay, so the wrong bond links. And then our second problem is that they're going to be at the wrong angles to each other. So a 2px, 2py um, orbitals are going to be at 90 degree uh, to one another. So if we get the S overlap with hydrogen, we get hydrogen overlapping here, right? It's going to overlap in at a 90 degree angle. Um, so the 2P and hydrogen's S overlap, it's 2PX, and then the hydrogen's S overlap would be at 90 degree angle. So wrong bond lengths, wrong bond angles. Okay, and so what we're going to assume is that instead of using atomic orbitals, these are all going to hybridize together, and we're going to get four new orbitals. And since we used an S, a P, a P, and a P, we're, we're going to call these new orbitals S, P, 3, right? We use one S and three P's. So S, P, 3 is our new orbital designation. Now, again, I'm pretty sure that they all just kind of look like that. But what angle are they going to be at each other? They're going to be at 109.5. Instead of being at the 90 degree angle that the atomic orbitals are going to be at, the mo new molecular orbitals are actually going to be at 109.5. And so we get the correct structure. This one kind of comes out at us. This one kind of comes, goes back into it. And now when, when they overlap with hydrogen's S, a second hydrogen's s orbital, another hydrogen's s orbital, another hydrogen's s orbital. Now these overlaps, these bonding areas are going to occur at the at 
um, symmetrical bond lengths and at 109.5 angles to each other. Okay, and this just continues on. Your book will continue on to talk about um, what happens when there are five electron domains around an atom and how you need to hybridize an S, P, 3, D in order to get the correct bond lengths and bond angles. If you have six uh, electron domains around that central atom, you're going to have to hybridize S, three P's, and two D's in order to get the correct bond lengths and bond angles. It just continues to go on. Um, now, the you, you do need to be able to talk about hybrid orbitals. We're going to summarize this in just a second. And I think from a summarized view, it's going to look a little bit simpler. Um, now you know that there are, that the D orbitals can also be involved in this, but you are not responsible for talking about anything that has a D orbital or above. You just need to be able to talk about SP, SP2, SP3 hybrid orbitals. Um, the D orbitals are beyond the scope of our class and they are controversial anyway. So chemistry hot topic. There we go. Now you know, if you're talking to a chemist and you want to push some buttons, now you know how. Okay, so let's summarize this and see if we can get a functional, simplified view of this. This theory sounds crazy, right? But luckily for you, the test questions are really straightforward. And so um, let's address how this is going to look in a test question and um, what kind of things you're going to be able to need to be able to answer off of this. Okay, so here shows you, this just shows you that energy diagram again that we were talking about. If energy goes from low to high, you can see that the hybridized orbitals are in between um, energy wise, they're in between the low energy of the S and the higher energy of the P. The new hybridized orbitals are somewhere in the middle. And notice anything that's not hybridized still exists. It still hangs out out there. It's still there, right? And it's still at its original energy level. Um, these are the D orbitals that you know they exist, maybe, um, but they are beyond the scope of our class. You don't have to deal with them. If you run into book questions that ask about them, you can actually just skip those book questions. Okay, our summary here now. So um, when you're dealing with test questions like this, what they're going to ask you is what the hybridization is. So they'll give you a molecule and they'll say, what are the, what kind of hybridized orbitals will you find in this molecule? Okay, so remember a couple things. First of all, remember, they're only talking about the central atom. So if you get something like NH3, and you're trying to think about what kind of hybridized orbitals you might find in ammonia, you don't have to worry about any of hydrogen's orbitals, right? The only ones that hybridize are going to be the orbitals of the central atom. So the only, in this case, the only ones that are going to hybridize belong to nitrogen. So you can forget about anything that's on the exterior, in this case, hydrogen. You're just trying to analyze the central atoms. Okay, another thing you need to remember is this is very dependent on matching with the Vesper theory, right? So in order to tell me what kind of hybridiz hybridization occurs, what you really need to be able to tell me is what kind of angles come out of these and how many effective pairs are going to drive those angles. So remember, an, eff an effective pair can be a single bond. That's one effective pair. It could be a double bond. That's one effective pair. It can be a triple bond, one effective pair, or it can be a lone pair, one effective pair, right? All of these just count as one 
effective pair. So if you're looking at the central atom, what you want to do is count the effective pairs around the central atom. Another name for an effective pair would be a region that could cause electron repulsion, right? So if we're looking at nitrogen without its yellow halo, and we're counting effective pairs around it, there's four. One, two, three, four. Four effective pairs. Okay, so we know that the shape, uh, we know the shape of this from the Vesper theory, right? Shape is going to be tetrahedral, which is going to have a 109.5 degree angle with it, right? So in order to get a tetrahedral arrangement, we need four hybridized orbitals. So we're going to have S, P, 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 S, P, 3. That would give us our four molecular orbitals that could support a tetrahedral arrangement. Um, now in this case, we have taken our S, in our PPP, and we've hybridized all of them, right? So we have hybridized S, P, P, P. All of those are hybridized. We have no unhybridized orbitals. I mean, our core orbitals are unhybridized. Our unoccupied orbitals are unhybridized. But as far as like <clears throat> the orbitals inside the energy level, they're all hybridized. None of them are not hybridized. And anything with four effective pairs would count with this. CH4, NH3, all of them. Okay, so let's fill out this chart for two effective pairs and three effective pairs. This would be a good time to pause the video and see if you can fill out this chart and then come back and compare it to what we do together. All right, so if you have two effective pairs, you know from the Vesper theory that's going to be a linear shape with 180 degree angles, you need two effective pairs, right? So we're going to hybridize S and P and get an SP hybridized orbital. That means S and P are hybridized. P and P are still unhybridized, right? S, P, P, P. We're going to hybridize S and P, and then that leaves two P orbitals unhybridized. An example of this would be anything that's a linear molecule. So you could use B, E, F, 2, like we used uh, last lecture. You could also use C, O, 2. C, O, O is going to have two effective pairs. Notice one effective pair, two effective pairs around that carbon. We ignore anything around oxygen. Oxygen's not, it's an exterior atom. It's not involved in this hybridization. So two effective pairs, we're going to use S and P. We're going to hybridize those into an SP orbital. P and P are going to be left unhybridized. All right, and for three effective pairs, we need... Um, to think about the shape from the Vesper theory, anything that has three effective pairs around it in the Vesper theory is going to be a trigonal planar molecule with 120 degree angles between it. We're going to need three effective pairs, so we're going to hybridize three orbitals, S, P, P. So that means our hybridization is S, P, 2. So we're hybridizing S, P and P, those get hybridized. We have one orbital left unhybridized. It's one of our P orbitals. S, P, P, P. We're hybridizing to get to support three effective pairs. We need to hybridize three orbitals. So we're hybridizing S, P, P, and that leaves our last P unhybridized. An example of this would be anything that has three effective pairs around it, like beryllium trifluoride that we just talked about. And then let's just fill out this last row again. Tetrahedral, 109.5, sp3, 
S, P, 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 all hybridized. Nada is unhybridized. An example would be CH4 or NH3. Okay, so as you see, really, when they're asking you about hybridization, they're totally just basing it off the Vesper theory. If you look at the Vesper theory and you say, okay, well, there's three effective pairs around the central atom, you know you're, it's going to be S, P, 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 S, P, 3 hybridized. If there's two effective pairs around the atom, it's going to be S, P hybridized, right? If there's three around the central atom, it's going to be S, P, P hybridized, so S, P, 2 orbitals. So we could have taught this whole lesson in five minutes and I could have just told you that information and said, remember this, right? You probably wouldn't have remembered it in six months because you didn't understand the process behind it. Now you understand the process behind it. Hopefully in six months, you'll be able to tell me what kind of hybridized orbitals exist for specific molecules. We'll deal with some practice over that in class too. Okay, so here's your summary chart. Um, this is exactly the chart we just went over. So if you want a reference for this, um, this chart is always there for you. It also has a couple um, examples over here on the side. If you want to go through and kind of walk through this process on your own, you could just pick one of these molecules <clears throat> and kind of walk, force yourself to go through those steps we just talked about and see if you can come up with the correct hybridization. Remember, anything that involves a D shell, which is anything below this line, you're not going to be held responsible for on the test, but it is the exact same process. So once you understand that process, you should be able to predict those too. Um, but if you're doing practice, you might want to stay above the line. And then again, here's another summary in words. So if you want to kind of follow through and write out the steps, um, it is very dependent on the Vesper. So if you first draw the Lewis and then determine the Vesper, just like you would when you were determining Vesper anyway, or going to determine polarity from the Vesper theory, then you would identify hybrid orbitals. Okay, so this sets us up to understand multiple bonding. Um, so let's talk about these orbitals and how they're overlapping and how that, that theory of the valence bond hybridization um, sets us up to understand multiple bonding. So we have to deal with two more definitions here. And those two definitions are a sigma bond and a pi bond. So sigma and pi, the difference between them is overlap. If you have direct overlap head to head, so that can be an S overlapping with an S. That can be a P orbital overlapping with another P orbital. It could be an S overlapping with a P orbital, or it could be a hybridized orbital overlapping with a P or an S over, over orbital. So all of those are direct overlaps. All of those are sigma bonds. Now, before I tell you anything more about sigma bonds, let me tell you what is not a sigma bond. So a direct overlap is going to be a sigma bond, right? If I have two, pon two pens and I overlap them this way, it'd be a sigma bond. A pi bond is when you take those orbitals, you turn them sideways, and they have to overlap sideways. That is going to be a p bond. So if I take a p orbital and then a second p orbital, and they overlap here in these regions, that if the bond exists in a side to side overlap, that's going to be a pi bond. And already we can see a couple implications of these different types of bonding, right? The sigma bond, if we stick with the P to P overlap, 
it's pretty clear to see a sigma bond is going to be able to overlap more, right? We talked about how there's the, like if they're too far away, it's a high energy system. If they're too close, it's a high energy system. Well, the sigma bond overlap has more space to work with before you force these um, nuclei too close together, right? They can overlap a lot more before the nuclei get too close together. So the overlap is more than in a pi bond. A pi bond, the p orbitals have to get a lot closer to overlap, and so you're gonna be dealing with more repulsion. As a result, a sigma bond is more stable than a pi bond because of that overlap region. Similarly, we can see lengths here. If we have a bond that occurs because of the sigma overlap, that bond is gonna be longer. If we have two p orbitals that have to overlap side by side in order to bond, they're going to have to get a lot closer before they can actually overlap. So a sigma bond is going to be longer, a pi bond is going to be closer. Um, okay, so now that you know a couple things about sigma and pi, um, let's talk through a couple examples. Um, before we get to the examples, however, let's look at just two of these. We'll stick with the P to P overlap just for consistency's sake. Okay, I want you to look at where the electrons are concentrated. If remember, the electrons are going to sit inside that overlap region. So, where does that overlap region occur? relative to the nucleus. Okay, and you can see for a sigma bond, that overlap occurs along the line of the nucleus, right? So if that red line is the line that our nucleus sits in, that overlap is gonna occur right in the same plane as the nucleus. On the other side, on a pi bond, however, the electrons, the bonding electrons actually sit above the nucleus or below the nucleus. So for this reason, also, a sigma bond is going to be much more stable than a pi bond. Sigma bonds can overlap more, giving them more stability. Sigma bonds also contain the electrons in the line of the nucleus, making them more stable. Now there is a flip side to this that we'll talk about, um, and that is, uh, I'm debating whether I want to introduce this to you now or later, but um, let me just tell it to you now and then we'll deal with it. So the electrons for a sigma bond can also exist on the other side of the p orbital. And so that situation, if that situation occurred, it would be much more unstable than either of these other circumstances. So the number one best place for electrons to sit is going to be in the middle of the nuclei on the plane of the nuclei. The second best place is going to be above or below the nucleus, right? Not as good as in line, but still okay. And then the worst place for an electron to sit is actually going to be outside of that nucleus. So we'll talk about when all of these situations occur. Okay, let me start with a simple um, diagram and that is with two hydrogens bonding with each other. Okay, so a hydrogen-hydrogen bond is going to occur with a 1s, 1s overlap, right? So 1s, 1s overlap is going to be a sigma bond because we have a direct overlap there. Okay, let's contrast that to C2H4. All right, so this one's a little bit trickier because we have a couple different bonds happening, but stay with me on this. So C2, 
H4. Okay, so notice for the any for either of the carbons, right? For either of the carbons, you have three effective pairs around the carbon, which means we're going to deal with an sp2 overlap, right? So for the carbon, it has used 1s, oh no, that'd be a 2s, 2p. Okay, so it has hybridized its s and two of its p's, right? And that's what it's using to support that um, structure. So I'm going to draw this again using the hybridized orbitals for each carbon. So here's a carbon and here's an sp2 orbital. Here's another sp2 orbital and another sp2 orbital. So we see that these sp2 orbitals can overlap with the hydrogens and that those are going to be sigma bonds, right? A direct overlap whether it's with an SS, a PP, or a hybridized S or a hybridized P, those are going to be sigma bonds. Now this other SP orbital can overlap with the other carbons, SP2 orbitals. And that carbon can sigma bond with the hydrogens, sigma, sigma. Now notice I have an SP2 sp2 overlap. That's going to be a sigma bond. All right. Now, however, notice there's one orbital for carbon that hasn't hybridized yet, and it's the p orbital. That p orbital still exists for each carbon. So here is your unhybridized p orbital for each carbon. This is where the double bond comes from. Notice in our Lewis dot diagram, we have a double bond down here, right? Well, that double bond, the first bond in it is a sigma overlap. The second bond in the double bond is the PP overlap. So this P for this carbon and this P for this carbon are going to overlap. And in order to do so, the carbons have to get a lot closer to each other in order to establish this pi bond. And so this is what a double bond is. A double bond is a sigma pi bond. It's a sigma bond that occurs because of direct overlaps, probably from hybridized orbitals, plus a pi bond that occurs from a unhybridized overlap of p, unhybridized p, p orbitals. Okay, so I could ask you a couple questions off of this. I could ask you, first of all, why is a, why is a double bond shorter than a single bond? Well, a double bond is shorter than a single bond because the pi, in order for the pi bond to occur, you need a PP overlap sideways. And so these atoms have to get a lot closer in order for that overlap to occur. I could also ask you, why is a double bond shorter? Oh no, I just asked you that. Why is a double bond stronger than a single bond, right? And it's stronger because they both have sigmas, one sigma, one sigma, but a double bond also has one pi. It has a sigma and a pi together. Now, which one's stronger, a sig sigma or a pi? A sigma is stronger. Sigma is stronger than pi, but sigma with a pi is stronger than one sigma by itself. It's like saying, okay, if we're playing tug of war, right? Which one's going to be a better tug of war player, an adult or a child? An adult is. They have developed muscles, they have developed bones, they're taller, they have more leverage, they have more weight, right? But what's going to be stronger, one adult by themselves or one adult plus a child, right? The adult plus a child is going to be stronger than just the adult by themselves. Same thing, the double bond is going to be stronger because it has a sigma and a pi together. A single bond's slightly weaker because it just has a sigma bond by itself. So much is making sense. I know it's kind of crazy, but it's all falling into place. It's got to feel a little bit good, right? Okay, so this would be a really good, good 
place to pause and walk through this with N2. So diatomic nitrogen down here at the bottom. What kind of bonding occurs in diatomic nitrogen? Pause here and go through it. So for nitrogen, you're going to have a similar situation, right? Nitrogen bonds to nitrogen. This is what the Lewis dot diagram looks like. And so it's linear, right? The nitrogen, if you treat one of these nitrogens as a central atom, it has two effective regions around it. And so that nitrogen is going to have a sp bond, sp hybridized orbital around it. It's going to orbitize, hybridize 1s and 1p, and it's going to leave its two other p orbitals unhybridized. So notice for each hydrogen or each nitrogen, you're going to have that sp orbital and you're going to overlap it and that's going to be a sigma bond. But the nitrogen also has an unhybridized p, p, okay, and those unhybridized p's are going to overlap for a pi bond. So that's this one, okay, and remember you have it for each atom. And then your other p orbital, let's make it a p z p z okay so they're also going to overlap sideways lengthwise for another pi overlap so in a triple bond you get a sigma pi pi overlap okay now again this explains why triple bonds are going to be shorter it explains why triple bonds are going to be stronger um, there's some explaining power here. Um, again, it's kind of a convoluted theory. It's kind of tricky. It's kind of out there. But again, the test question, questions are very straightforward. What they'll do is they'll give you a molecule, H2, and they'll say, what kind of bonding is inside that? So in order to tell me what kind of bonding is inside it, you need to draw the Lewis dot structure right? And the Lewis structure for hydrogen, diatomic hydrogen, looks like that. You know it's a single bond, so it must just be a sigma bond. What kind of bonding is inside nitrogen, the diatomic nitrogen? Well, if you can draw diatomic nitrogen's Lewis dot structure, you see it's a triple bond, so you know it's a sigma pi pi bond. Again, the theory is kind of tricky, but the test questions really come down to the Lewis structure and recognizing what kind of bond is there, and then knowing that a single bond is a sigma bond, a double bond is a sigma pi, and a triple is a sigma pi pi. If you know that, you can answer all of the test questions. We'll do some practice together. And then we have one more topic within this idea of molecular orbitals. And we are done with bonding. So let me know what questions you have. We'll talk about this concept next class and uh, or next asynchronous video. And I'll see you in class.